What's up, everybody? Welcome to the show. Happy fourth quarter. If you're not still working, you're probably not in the game. You're not in the business right now because this is the two busiest weeks of the year, I would say. So happy fourth quarter to everybody listening. Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching live, you're watching on podcast, still listening fourth quarter. Good, because we got good stuff for you. Wanted to bring in some guys. We're bringing some advisors that we work with. Um, some guys just share their changes, their strategies, kind of what they're doing here from your peers out in the market that maybe don't a while, may just started doing different things and just kind of share with you to let you know that you can do it as well. And so tonight's show, we brought in one of our favorite advisors uh, that works with us. And, you know, going from a bro more of a broker to an advisor level is a, is a big leap. But there's a way to go fast. There's a way to go fast in many things, and that's learn from other people and put in the time to learn. And so I'm excited to have my good friend John Millen on because he's a guy that listens, take action, practices, and tries things right away. And his learning curve has been ramped up so fast. It's I love it. I love to see it. Let's welcome to the show. John Millen, how are you, buddy? Okay. Yeah, I'm I'm unmute. I got to unmute you. Go ahead. Welcome to the show, John. I got you. All right. How's that? Perfect. Excellent. So, John, welcome to the show. Uh, let's just start from the beginning. You're out of what state now? I'm in Richmond, Virginia. Virginia, right? So talk to us. Let's go back. You got into the game. You're a benefit advisor. When did the change start happening? Cutting my grass. Listening to you and Craig on a podcast. Um thinking before I listened to that first episode that I had figured it out because we had come up with a solution that we had been now working with for 10 years, which is kind of a, a secondary insurance gap solution that had worked really well. So I, I thought I kind of had figured things out for working with mid and large size employers. And one day I had seen you on LinkedIn and I'd seen Craig on LinkedIn, Craig Lack, and and saw this heads up advisor. And it, honestly, I was not open minded to learning. I thought I kind of had figured it out, which was a big mistake. But sometimes when the student is ready, the teacher will appear and you appeared and you appear to my ear as I'm sweating my butt off, cutting my grass. I'm listening to this podcast and I'm hearing things I've never heard before. So that's probably John four years ago when I first just started absorbing, like, what am I hearing? Why is this feel so different? And that's kind of when the, the journey began. And so you hear this four years ago. So now let's talk about how long did it take? Do you say, shit, let me get off my ass, get my ass off the lawnmower here and start taking some action and start listen, you know, taking action on what I'm learning and hearing here. Yeah. So um, I got frustrated competing with the big broker houses. I, and I had worked up with with them for years in other capacities. So I had formed partnerships with big brokerage houses and was always frustrated that I was trying to teach them how to sell medical. And early on, we didn't sell medical and I was beating my head against the wall. And then I got tired of when we started offering medical maybe five years ago or so, four years ago, that um, that we were competing against the big houses. And we were saying, look, we're a small boutique firm. We're not we don't have an in-house ERISA. We don't have 3,000 employees. What we do have is creative ideas and new strategies. And so I got tired of get, beating up against that and not having anything to compete with. So I realized I have to do things differently. I have to move from a broker relationship to an advisor relationship. And up until then, John, I thought it was the same. Yeah. I mean, we, we talk about, you know, I always relay it to benefits management benefits consulting or advisory right it, it's kind of the whole story of the cpa versus the tax strategy cpa files your taxes tax strategy is going to tell you how to actually save money on your taxes um and so it takes time to learn it and actually understand what you're doing but you you have to compete against the abc houses from a different playing field right they're going to play to their strengths we're going to play to our strengths right we all have strengths but traditionally, they manage benefits well and nothing against some of them that that do the right thing. And I'm I'm for them. And I know there's some guys I spoke to plenty of them that do it. It's a little bit of a tougher hurdle for them. And they usually eventually go independent at some point. But, you know, going from this advisor or broker change to an advisor. Talk to me about that, because there's guys like you that are listening 
right? You took some time. I didn't know it was four years ago. Shit. I remember our first call. I was in, I was sitting, <laughs> I was sitting at the hotel looking somewhere on the, on the beach in Laguna <laughs> beach. One of the be- most beautiful views at this hotel. Yeah. I remember the call distinctively and the excitement, but you had to change your mindset. You know, we've learned through you, you can teach an old dog new tricks. Yeah. And so what did that look like for those that are listening and that are saying, you know, I can't do it. I'm, I'm, I'm over 50. I'm done. You know, the story's over. Let me just ride this out and let me uh, just protect what I have. Yeah. What's, no, your, it, what's your story to them? Absolutely. Look, I'm 54 and I have not been in this industry that long, but I have been a master student. The, the thing that I learned really quickly when I first, after I'd listened to the podcast and then once I, we got engaged and then um, I realized I need to quickly learn what I, what I don't know. I didn't know enough. And I let my ego down. I said, look, what's my goal? My goal is to help a company, to help their employees, to keep them for long term, to provide income to our agency. We have um, six employees, provide income to the agency and help support my family and the families that I work with. I And I'm the primary producer of the firm. My wife, Laura, started the company 20 years ago, and, and she's been an amazing vision, visionary, and she handles a lot of the operational piece and the vision. But I was mostly responsible for bringing in new accounts. I'm like, and I was kind of sucking wind. We track things. And I was like, oh, I'm helping other people. And I got caught up in my own excuses. And so busy work. You got a lot of busy work going on. You're a busy, busy guy, right? That's a, that's the old broken trap. I'm so, so busy. I, <laughs> so I re, so I started hearing this broker, advisor, consultant, and it, and it came from you guys. So the, what I think, here's what I say. A broker is someone that brokers a, a transaction between two people. And there's nothing wrong with that. You have this party and this party, and a broker is in between and trans makes money in the transaction. And most of the brokers that I see, um, provide options, but not advice. I've seen this real real time in many, many years. We've been in the voluntary benefits industry going back 20 years. So we saw working with brokers. And so they're paid by the seller of the services, not the buyer of the services. And so I realized that I wanted to give more advice because I'm a mechanical engineer. I spent four years in college learning some really probably useless things at this point, but lots of great insights on how to learn. And I wanted to give advice. I was tired of saying, here's five options. What do you think? Well, they don't understand like we understand. So I'd rather say, look, here's five options. I think you should do option one and here's why. And I will help you take you on that journey as your advisor. And what I would say, you have to then take the next step to be a consultant. And if you say I'm an advisor, then the question I would have and the question I asked me is, would you put your compensation on the line and only get paid for performance, not get paid from the carriers, get paid a flat rate from the company direct. And that changes your mindset, not only a year or two when I started thinking about this, but now it's required with the new federal law that's been passed. You have to disclose all your income above the whatever the 5500 says, you have to disclose all your income. So I would say if you want to make that shift, and you don't have to. It's a lot more fun to be an advisor or a consultant. And even if it's in your head, it's a lot more fun and it's a lot more lucrative. Yeah. I, I remember getting calls from John or videos of the excitement, leaving prospects and going in and telling them, you know, lines that we may have suggested or saying, I'm not going to quote for free. It's this fee and an excitement leaving because it worked. Right. And that reminded me of when Craig taught it to me many years back, the excitement of going to the car and saying, Holy shit, it worked. And we're we're victims of our own industry thinking that this is how all the other industries work with clients. And, and no, it's not. They get paid for their advice. Now, you have to be able to give them, uh, a, you know, objective expert advice. That's a whole nother story. But the reality is, is you can lower health care costs. You can get paid for the value you deliver. And look, many of you out there may not want to do consulting agreements. That's fine. We just want to help you win more business, convert, make more money, pay for your marketing. And some of those clients will convert to broker of records or some of them won't. Some of them will never hire you as a boutique shop to manage their benefits. And that's OK. We've worked with people that manage benefits and we just provide them for advice and got paid for our advice and introducing that to them. And so 
John, you, you, you've changed your mindset now. Talk to me about the old way of going in versus the new way and what that first meeting looks like. And, you know, do you quote, do you begging him? You know, what does that look like for those listening that are saying, um, I've had enough of this. The market's changing. I need to change with it. Yeah, you, this um, this was tough. So I'm not suggesting any of this. This journey has been just so easy um, because you have to break old habits. You have to break your old mindset and how you think you have to look, have more value in what you're offering. You have to look yourself in the mirror more, which is really hard if you're like, I don't know if I'm really worth that fee. So it drove me because I wasn't worth it. I'm like, I, I'm hearing these bits and pieces from John and Craig. I'd say I had to borrow their belief first before I had it. They kept saying, you can do this. Just you're going to maybe make some mistakes. You're going to learn and you're going to get into bigger accounts. And, and don't think just because they're bigger. Oh, my gosh, they've got 100 people on medical instead of 30 that it matters. It's all mindset. And once you learn it. So what I did was I had to figure out tactically and strategically what I would do differently so that I had more confidence so that if I called someone on the phone or I do a lot of email marketing you could get onto a thing about that but I do a lot of email where they want to talk to me um, I had to be comfortable in my own um, suit that what I was going to say in the conversation I was going to have not the pitch Craig and John talk you guys talk a lot about this you have a conversation for a few minutes to see if it's a fit this all changes your your attitude. And I don't feel like a salesperson in the past. Hey, we got an appointment. All right. We're all excited. Hey, can you send us your your census and your re renewal and your current docs? And then I would documents and I would go out and bid it and spend all this energy and not get the case 90 percent of the time. And I would think. They're just not very smart. They don't understand what they're saying no to. But in reality, either they didn't have pain that they wanted to solve or I didn't have enough value. They looked at me and said, thank you for the free work. And they handed it off to their existing advisor. Yeah, I mean, and, and that's the reality is, is, you know, 10 percent. I mean, an old person in the business told me a long time ago when I started, you know, if you get 10 appointments a month, you close one, you can make a lot of money and you can. You will make a lot of money. That's why there's so many people in the business. But if you can get to 20 percent. Well, even better. But the reality is, is that first meeting is the qualifying meeting, which a lot of advisors, including myself in the beginning, didn't do well. And that first meeting is a qualifying meeting. And the goal is, how do I disqualify them as fast as possible? So we're not wasting our time and effort on this when I can focus more on the cases that are closable, right? We're not trying to turn shit into gold. I have a new employee that you know, is at all by the fact that we DTQ so many groups that come in when prior where they were, the TPA quoted every single group. I had an advisor yesterday question, you know, why won't you look at it? And I had to do the math and go, this has a 0, 0.00 chance of closing because of these factors. And we know that due to our experience. And so you've got to get to the point, learning, being a student of the game to realize this is not a prospect. This isn't even a suspect. Okay. And by doing that, it allows you to focus your time in the right place, right? And yep. even better, more with your clients. You know, that's better time spent than with prospects that have no chance. And so talk to me about the conversation now, what that end meeting looks like, your style. What? How do you propose it? How do you pivot from the old way of doing things now with the prospect and telling them, hey, I'm going to charge you? Yeah, so this um, this took a little time. So I remember jumping on John's calls and I would share like the, the screw ups I'd have, but looking back, I needed that. I needed the experience, the reps to realize, okay, don't do that again. So I didn't get too concerned because I had, I was looking for new people to talk to. I was using different mechanisms. So I wasn't desperate for people. That's the first thing. If you're desperate to talk to people, you're going to come across this, but you need to find a way where you have people to talk to, whether you pay an appointment setter, or you do email marketing or do on LinkedIn or you have an employee or you hire someone virtually. So that kind of flow allowed me to practice and not feel like I couldn't make the mortgage for my family or make payroll. Um, the other thing I did is I think you, what I would say for anyone, even if you have no idea what I'm talking about, is you have to understand how healthcare works. How does a healthcare plan operate? And you may want to take a note because this is what I say all the time. And once I understood how it worked, 
Then I understood the pitfalls. Once I understood the pitfalls, then I understood the solution. And then I could ask the questions on the front end to see if we're ever going to get to the end. And that's what John just said by disqualifying. I never disqualified. I was like, do they have employees? We're taking them. Okay, it's a restaurant with 200% turnover. I don't care. You know, I would burn through that. The first thing is understanding how healthcare works, that there are basically three or four different components in the cost that they spend. You have you, or components. You have the network, which is your Cigna, UHC, Anthem, um, Aetna, uh, Blue Cross, whatever it is. You have the network of providers. You have the insurance level that covers the big claims. You have a pharmacy manager, PBM, that controls the pharmacy spend. You have a third party administrator or an administrative person that pays the bills to that come in. And then you have claims uh, funding for the money that's being paid for claims. So you have three or four or five, however you want to bucket it. When you understand that, and I heard this from John and Craig, this is where I got it. 80% of the cost of what every company pays is related to one thing. And I, I, on all my initial calls, I say that same thing. I said, there's one thing that no one's talking about that contributes to 80% of what you spend. Do you know what it is? And they, they don't know. It's claims. It's the claims. And so 80% of it is claims. Yes, you can save a little bit up here. But when you understand the relationship of how that works, and that caused me to ask a bunch of questions with John and Crystal and your whole team and Craig, I don't understand what you're saying. Like they'd say something and I didn't get it. So I dug in and tried to first understand how does it work first, and then you can transition to what do we do that's different? So now you have some differentiator. And then when you have that first call, you have confidence to know whether you think it's going to make it to the end. Yeah, and we're doing um, typically, you know, and I'd even, I'd even say we like to say 80 to 90 cents of every dollar is directly or indirectly related. What does that mean? Directly related is the claims. Indirectly is a stop loss, which is subject to claims. So it's almost a whole dollar. Um, and that's where the focus is. You're missing the boat. Um, if you're not doing anything like that, I mean, it's 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 comical that we're in this world. But I mean, this is the world that we're coming from. And for those that are listening to the show, been listening to the show, we've repeatedly told you and you're ahead of the curve. And I laugh sometimes. I mean, John, you got to laugh when you get into these groups, even larger groups, and they had never heard of it. They don't know what's going on. And it's and and they're not being talked about it because, again, the brokers that are pr not listening to this show are trying to, you know, are either sold to the ABC houses and they're riding it out or they're just trying to stick to what they have. And they don't want to put anything at risk. They don't want to risk trying this on a new on their current client and they got no new business. So they don't have it. Can't try it on them. So they're just holding on for dear life and thinking a relationship is going to keep them. And I got news for you. It's not because at some point the pressure's there at some point, the management changes, um, new people come in and you're out. You got nothing to protect you. If you have a strategy, like what we're doing with virtue health and, and the whole text or the whole health stack that we have, it's very difficult to take that apart or get somebody else to even come in to understand it. And the employer, the owner is going to say, no, don't fire that guy. That guy saves me a ton of money. You're not firing him. Their friend that they got from the other company, they can't bring them in and tell them, you know, we give better service and all this stuff. No, it's so deep and complex. I never was worried about groups that I took self-funded because that's a way to protect it. Um, let me not go off spin on a thing. So go back to. OK, so, me, so that's the first thing. If you if you're saying to yourself what he just said, I have no idea. That's OK, because literally 12 or 14 months ago, I didn't know it either. Like it didn't take me long. Now, I, I have a family I take care of. I have employees and I want to help people and I need to get paid. So if I don't do something different. I'm going to be in serious trouble. So I had motivation to try to 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 study. I went for four years as a mechanical engineer. You need to spend some time. And I have a whole binder um, of just all my notes that I take, every conference, every thing I don't ever want to look um, forget. I write it down because you're going to forget it. So you need to spend a little time. And the more time you spend, you invest, the more confidence you get and the more fun it becomes. So this pendulum swung from I'm, I'm needy, I'm desperate. I don't know anything about what they just said to, oh, okay, I understand a little bit. And then I, I leveraged the fact that I have partners and mentors that I work with. It wasn't just me. It was John and Craig and John's staff, my team, 
So it wouldn't, didn't become, it, it's not that I figured this out. It's that big companies have been doing this for a long time. And now these strategies have moved downstream. That's why you might not have heard about it. We call it, I call it partial self-funding and, it, and it's all getting very technical, but I say, what we're looking to do is possibly build a custom health plan, just like you might build a custom home. A regular home is a track home and it's just what it is. A custom home, if you want a tankless water heater to recycle from your rainwater off the, off the roof, the custom builder will put that unique feature in and you never have to use new water, it gets recycled. We do the same thing when we build a custom health plan. And I've learned, I'm not trying to be a shiny object because I know it's based on the fundamentals, so it's not a shiny thing. But if you start explaining things in different terms, I don't say, I want to talk to you about self-funded. Because most of the time they go, yeah, we tried that 15 years ago. That doesn't work. Well, if it's true self-funding where you're funding 100% of all the claims with no insurance, yeah, that makes no sense unless you have a lot of employees. So understand what it is. And then you're going to say, well, what makes this different? Like what makes the pharmacy piece from Anthem or any of the retail plans where they just build it? What makes that different from a custom pharmacy benefit manager? And then you will learn through John and his team, the ones you should focus on. Here's what's helped John for me. I didn't try to reinvent this wheel. I was like, I don't know what the heck I'm doing when it comes to PBMs. Who do, should I use? Like it was literally whoever you tell me is fine because you have vetted this and you've made mistakes probably in the past that you don't make anymore. So that's where I came to virtue and said, look, they're kind of a turnkey thing. I'm not going to try to piece this together myself. That is a complete waste of time. I'm going to go to the experts that are my partner that we do it together. And, and that has freed me up from having to know everything about the process. I pull them into the conversation as needed. Yeah, and that's one thing as advisors, we get tied up in shiny objects and learning this and vetting out different vendors. You'll never have, you know, I, I fell for that trap. You'll never have enough experience as an individual advisor really to, to, to learn it that fast without sharing it in others and seeing what others are doing and having, fortunately I'm the wholesale side. So I see so many different things and we keep optimizing it and bringing new partners in to manage the risk. But as an advisor, you stick to marketing and selling. Yes. You need to have some education, but most of it is selling. And so, you know, the thing we liked about John was he was a student of the game and, you know, you study, you try it, you practice. Um, talk about sales training. A lot of us at advisors, I mean, we, we did a show when Kobe Bryant, when he passed and we talked about how many hours a week a day he practiced and it's mind blowing how many hours he practiced before the game. And yet us as advisors, we don't even play that many games. We get three, three, four at bats a month as an advisor, which isn't good. Right. And we're still not practicing. At least if you had more at bats, you'd at least get practice in the, in the game per se. But nobody practices. Talk, talk to us about how much time you spend, your learning, podcasts. What are you doing from an educational standpoint to get yourself better for when the time comes to present that you're ready to go and the confidence certainty is there because that's all we're selling. Yeah. So here's how I think of the, the sales funnel. So everyone's seen the funnel, right? People come in on the companies come in and then you drop out and some of them get recycled. Um so this is just the way I think about it. Everyone has a little different definition. To me, marketing is broadcasting your value proposition into the environment, whatever that is, radio, internet, email, and warming people up to what it is, the value of the people you serve and how you help solve their problems and what makes you different. So you have your customer, ideal customer, you have what problems are they facing and how do you solve them faster and easier than other people? That's marketing. And then as they start to come in top of funnel, so marketing might be LinkedIn. That's not selling. Like that networking parties, that's not selling. That's marketing. You're not doing any sales at that point. When they start to come into the top of the funnel, I think of that as, and John said it, um, disqualifying. What I'm saying now, and I didn't say this before, is let's have a short conversation to see if it even makes sense to have a second one. So I'm not selling on that first call because I'm way up here in the funnel. So what it does is there's no pressure. I used to freak out on my calls, research the company, find out where the guy person went to school. Maybe I can make a connection, trying to get all gimmicky. 
it was it was exhausting. And now I'm like, wait a minute, we're way up here and disqualifying, or I'm just gonna see how that makes sense. And I'll tell you exactly, and this is gonna be recorded so you can use this. This has worked really well for me. And I saw a drastic change. It is so simple and it puts you more in a little bit of a power position, but not to be arrogant. When I get on a call with someone and I book 30 minute calls, I do a lot of Zoom calls. Um, so I don't do an hour, I don't do 15 minutes. because That seems a little weird, I do 30 minutes. And I say, look, hey, John, I'm glad that I could carve out some time for you and I to get together. I know you're super busy, I'm super busy. The purpose of this first call really is just to see if it makes sense to have a second call. Is that okay with you? And you can see the, the relief come down because like, oh, thank God, I'm not gonna get pitched or stay on forever. And then I say, these calls don't take very long, maybe 15, 20, 25 minutes. And um, before we get into learning a little bit about what's going on with you, would it be okay if I told you a little bit about what we do that's unique in the industry? What makes us a little different in the benefits space? And they always say yes. And I think it's because they want some time to realize who the heck is this person again? Like sometimes you get on a call, you don't realize what it's about. And then someone asks you questions and about two questions in, you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. All, why all the questions? Because they forgot why they were there. So I am, I don't care when the appointment was set. I say the same thing and I go through three things. We're going to talk about whether it makes sense to move you from buying um, healthcare retail to wholesale. And when you, when you, when you change from retail to wholesale, you normally save money and you can normally improve the benefits. Not always. It's too soon to tell, but we're, that's kind of what the plan is. The second thing is we're going to put in place a program to control the number one driver of your, of your costs, which is claims. And the third thing is we act as a fiduciary on your plan, a fee-based advisor, or maybe a buy-side advisor versus a sell-side advisor so that we're aligned with your interests. Is there anything there that you want to discuss more? And to me, it's more of a sorting process and they open up. You've built trust. You're not desperate. You're cognizant of their time. My time is just as valuable. And you, they then start having a conversation and sometimes they get right into it. Let me tell you what we got. And I'm always weaving in at some point. Tell me what's going on. Why did you, dis you know, what's going on with your plan that, that caused you to want to get on the call? I'm trying to very gently find out where the pain is. And then in the course of that 20 minutes, I'm just thinking by asking questions, having conversation, does it make sense to go to the next step? And it truly is. I've been on last two weeks, maybe six calls. I think three of them I disqualified and they were shocked. I think they were like, really? We're good? I'm like, yeah. The other thing you need to learn, and then I'll turn back to you, John, is if you don't understand per employee per year metric, P-E-P-Y, you should go back in the podcast, I don't know, two, three years ago, find the one that talks about per employee per year, P-E-P-Y, and listen to that 10 times till you understand what that means. And then on these calls, I'm getting rough numbers on what that is. And if a company's, their, their, their total per employee per year cost is $6,000, it's not a fit. And I end the call. Yeah, I mean, there's there's just so many ways to do disqualifying. I'm taking notes. On, I like that you said I sell. Uh, they sell options, not advice. I like I like that line. I might I might steal that one from you. And, um, and so you're saying, look, we're going to teach you how to buy wholesale instead of retail. Right now, you're buying retail, paying retail prices. We're going to teach you how to buy wholesale. I mean, that's a hook and an interesting way to do it, and not sound like every other advisor out there. Um, you've spent time on the hunters club calls, you're listening to podcasts, you're putting in the hours, um, and you're practicing cause you got a lot of leads, right? Are you less of a needy advisor? Cause of all of that combined, you have more appointments. Is that why, you know, the neediness goes down or you're just confidence has gone through the roof that, Hey, I can sniff this out and realize I need to tell these people, no, and go to the next one. Yeah, that's interesting. It's a process. Um, I went overboard and I can tell a quick story how I went way too far with uh, not being needy in front of a live customer in their conference room, which is quite comical. Um, it's 
understanding how the system works. Then you're like, wow, no one knows this. So I'm going to teach people this. I'm not going to sell them this. I'm going to educate. It's learning how does virtue health help with that. So if you're already there, but you're like, I don't understand. Why don't I just go to Blue Cross Blue Shield and do an ASO contract? Then you need to talk to virtue health so they can explain to you what a custom wholesale partially self-funded plan is. Once that sinks in, you're like, holy cow, why is not everyone doing this? So that builds your confidence. Um, you need some kind of flow of appointments. And here's the thing I would say. I used to qualify the quality of all the leads, no matter where they came from. You can run in radio ad if you want to a, a landing page and have them fill out a form. You just need to have some flow. And sometimes it's just a practice. Like you have to be willing if you're not going to make cold calls. And I don't like cold calling. I did it before. I didn't like it then. I'm in sales. I don't like it now. So I have transitioned and figure out what other things can I do so that I have a flow of people to talk to. Some are not going to be qualified, but here's the mistake people make. They're like, oh, it was a bad lead. Did you learn anything on the call that can help you for the next one? Like I was on a call with a company with 250 um, employees on medical um, and they, uh, from an email, a cold email, and they spend $350,000 a year funding the HSA account. Now, that story wouldn't have come up for future use if I hadn't made that time and gone through that uh, client that it didn't close. And so you need some, some way of having a flow. If you're not going to cold call, then you need to either pay for leads, pay for advertising, and figure it out. Because it, if you don't have people, you feel desperate. The other thing I did, and I met this gentleman at your boot camp in California last year. Um, his name is Oren Claff, O-R-E-N-K-L-A-F-F, -F. O Oren Claff. It was, it was mind blowing. He wrote a book called Pitch Anything, and he spoke on stage as a guest speaker. The dude is like way high in terms of competence. He pitches uh, private equity deals and multi-million dollar deals. That's who's, that's what he's selling, not healthcare. And he taught me how not to be needy. He taught me how to come across a different way and believe in what we have to offer. And so I combined all of those and then I started just implementing it and just getting better at it the more I did it. Yeah. Student of the game. I, I mean, I love it. It's a matter of, you know, learning, 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 and then taking action, and implementing. That's something that you've done so well. I congratulate you on that um, um, wholeheartedly. You, you, you've gotten over now. You're selling self-funded. I mean, we did a call today. What, what's that like now? Uh, you've taken group self-funded. How do you feel the fact that, hey, I actually can get my clients results and I actually lower health care costs? What confidence now is, is that like coming in the meetings knowing, hey, I actually know what I'm doing and I can actually do this. This actually works. Yeah. So at first I'm borrowing 100 um, percent someone else's belief. So, you know, John's been in this. I don't know. He was, he's been in it over a decade easily. He's been in virtual health for six years running this. So he's talked to a lot of people. Craig Lack's been in it 30 or 40 years. Um, Crystal. So their team has the experience. Um, and so um, I'm sorry, John, I just lost my train. What was the, what was the question? Well, what was the, the, the difference now that it's okay. The difference now that you've done self-funded uh, self-funding okay. on clients and you've gotten them results and, and you found out, Hey, this uh, stuff actually works. What do the meetings look like now that you now actually are a believer and actually you've done it? Yeah. So we had to get to that first one. So you got to keep going. Not all of them pan out, not all of them sell for different reasons. You always look back, but once we, we closed a nonprofit, um, we got an appointment with the CFO. So I suggest if you're calling for healthcare and this was a change, don't call on HR. Um, I did it for years and it was painful. And they said, call CFOs. And I was terrified because I didn't know what to say. Then they said, well, call the owner. And I was scared to do that until I understood what I had to sell. Then I was open to that. Um, so we called the CFO and I knew what the second step was going to be on a nonprofit. We specialize in nonprofits because it's just a really good industry. We like helping them. She said, I said, do you think we should bring the CEO? And I knew his name. And she said, yes. Second call with the CEO. And what was interesting on that, this is a, I'll get back to your question. I didn't tell them we we're going to save them money. In fact, I told them they might be spending more money. 
I'll talk about a hard call with the CEO and the CFO of a 150 life case to tell them I can't save the money and here's why, because they had put so many band-aids on their plan and they were sinking with huge renewal increases. We had to strip the band-aids off and start fresh. So we did that and that builds trust. When you say, look, I don't think we're gonna save any money the first year. Oh my God, no one's ever told them that, right? Every broker says we're gonna save money. And so when we implemented that April 1st, then we started to see the impact. The other really important thing about this whole thing, forget the commissions, forget the money, forget talking to the CEO. If you think about who is the end user of what you're doing. So when I'm in the meeting at this nonprofit, they make $40,000, $50,000 a year. They're in healthcare. They take care of people for their healthcare needs. They're a nonprofit community center. And 80% of them had a high deductible plan with no prescription coverage and basically catastrophic. So when we change that to co-pays for doctors, co-pays for specialists, four-tier pharmacy, co-pays, lower deductible, lower out-of-pocket max, during the meeting, the benefit meeting, you could see their face. They almost didn't believe us. And we use a national network, right? National in and out network. They're like, oh, we know them. And so the impact you have on people, when you make that connection, then that helped facilitate the next one. And as we've seen this, this first group roll out, we don't experience a lot of what's called back-end noise. Have you ever changed from Aetna to UHC, UHC to Blue Cross, and then there's always noise, something that they, the doctors aren't taking it or something's not working? There are issues in every implementation. I tell people that up front, we're going to have some issues. But what we're not seeing is employees upset with their coverage, employees upset with pharmacy, employees upset with how the plan itself is working. It's usually small things. And so once I saw that, John, the next one, I had a little more conviction. The next one, so now we've yeah, just- And you go into these meetings now with more of a passion and knowing what you can accomplish. And guys, all that all that stuff comes through when you're selling and presenting and the confidence and certainty, it gets conveyed over to the buyer. And that's really what you're selling in the end is confidence and certainty that you're confident in what you're doing. You're certain you're going to get them results and they can buy that. We're going to wrap, we're going to wrap it up, start to wrap it up. Final thoughts here for those listening, uh, John. Yeah, I would say um, it's going to be a journey. And some of you, like I, you may be way down the line from where I am. It's just a little bit of adjustment. You may be just starting out. So be willing to go through that journey and give yourself some grace that it, you're going to learn some things and you're going to mess up um, and give it, give it's okay. And you're surround yourself with people like virtue health that are that are willing to work with you on that and i would say um you know keep keep the end result in mind that if, if you keep if you forget about the employees it's so easy like if you don't have a mechanism to stay in touch with the employees like we have that so that's we're fortunate i'm a full service brokerage with full back-end support that keeps me going when i hear about um this new case john and i are working on they have someone on with uh, Crohn's disease, a child of a, an employee, and they're maxing their plan out every year because of the cost. And they have to drive all this way to get service. And it's that's really difficult on that family, on that employee. And that impacts the company, the employer. We're going to be able to show them a plan that may they may not have to spend any money. That just one person out of, out of 120 employees, one of them, when you when you see that, then you realize, oh, this is why I'm, I can grow. This is why I can take some, some negative feedback. This is why I can get thrown out of a conference room when you push a little too far after listening to Oren Claff five times in a row. It's okay because you realize what it is you're really doing when you strip it all away. You're really helping the people that is the greatest asset of the company. It's not their trucks. It's not their building. It's their people. And if you run across a company or prospect and you don't feel that way, you just leave. And then all of a sudden you're like, wow, now I've just basically walked away from a prospect because they don't view their employees as the number one asset. Excellent. Great stuff. I appreciate you sharing those listening. If you want to learn a newer way strategy to sell self-funding for January one, we're doing a weekly webinar. 
Uh, you could check it out at virtualalliance.com. Go to the events section. We're going to talk to you about that presentation, the number two meeting, presenting the solution, pain train. I'm going to give you a little template to, to help sell that. John, thanks again so much for joining yes. us. Congratulations to the success that you've had. I've seen it. We've watched you progress very fast, and uh, you'll continue. So thanks so much for joining, John. We appreciate yes. it. My pleasure. All right, everybody. Thanks for joining us. We're going to end it there. Heads up advisor next week, same place, same time. Check us out, virtualliance.com. It's about time to get those renewals released for 1-1. So good luck with them. We're happy to help. Book a demo if you haven't heard of us, and uh, we'll chat with you. Thanks for joining. Take care, everyone.